first of all, to begin, uh, just a few heat transfer principles. And I've tried to organize these slides in such a way that whether you are uh, new to this area or whether you're a seasoned veteran in uh, cryogenics, that you'll be able to pull something away from here and it'll be a valuable time for you. First of all, radiation. I just put a little note there. This is T to the fourth, T to the fourth power. So radiation can be kept very small and a very a small factor. However, uh, making mistakes with this can easily creep in and uh, be something that uh, introduces an enormous heat load on your sample. Uh, convection is another uh, uh, mode of uh, thermal transfer. We're not going to talk about that because in most cases we're in a vacuum. So then the final one is conduction. And this is probably, this is the primary way in which we are um, moving heat. So conductive thermal transfer. Uh, first of all, there are two primary ways in which heat is transferred through a material. It's uh, through electron travel, and you can see the two uh, little representations of the electrons and the lattice vibrations, which is the uh, second mode of heat transfer. Now for um, electrically conductive materials, the mode which uh, the heat is transferred is primarily electron travel. So that, that is, it, the lattice vibrations become something that is more dominant in room temperature materials and also more dominant in, um, uh, in electrically insulated materials. In fact, at Montana Instruments, when we test new materials, oftentimes we will just test the electrical properties at low temperature because that's a very good measure or indicator of what the thermal properties will be. As we get started here, there's a term that I would like to introduce to you. So if we move this temperature difference in the Fourier heat transfer equation over to the other side. So we've got heat, Q, which is the heat flow in watts over the temperature difference there. And then on the other side of the equation, we've got K, A, and L. So A and L are the geometrical constraints, and K is the thermal conductivity of the material itself. So by moving this over to the, the temperature delta over to the other side, and let's also make T2 minus T1, let's make it 1 Kelvin. That's often, often helpful in uh, making, doing calculations. We come up with the term conductance. Many of you may already be familiar with this, uh, but if you're not, this is a great way to analyze uh, parts of the system when it comes to uh, looking at how well you're transferring heat. So, Watts per Kelvin, meaning conductance, is basically a measure of the effectiveness of transferring heat. The reason this is important is because you can look at a, a thermal link, you can look at a sample mount, you can look at a, a certain interface or a series of interfaces, uh, you can look at different materials. There are a number of things that you can uh, Look at, look at the system from an eye of a specific component or from a number of components linked together. And so if we're, if we're looking at a new design or a new type of uh, thermal link or, or some new connection, we can always go back and say, well, you know, it may have a new fancy material, it may have a new fancy geometry, it doesn't matter. Let's just look at the conductance because that's all that really matters. As an example, if we say something that has one watt per Kelvin, and one watt per Kelvin is a nice number to shoot for. Uh, many parts of the system will have higher than that, and if you're trying to do something difficult, it might have something a little lower than that, but one watt per Kelvin is, is a good standard. But what this means is for an active load of 10 milliwatts, let's say you've got an active load from your laser of 10 milliwatts, you would expect that your temperature rise will be about 10 millikelvin. Okay, optimizing heat transfer. Now here is a connection between two parts. Now, many of us are familiar with the principles behind this. The materials need to be conductive. It helps to have a large area, the smooth surfaces between the interfaces, and then a soft interface. And, and uh, that, this can be gold or indium. Gold is a nice, uh, just make a quick note here, gold is a nice interface to have as far as plating the materials because what happens with bare copper 
is the, the very instant it, become, it comes in contact with oxygen, it oxidizes. And so even if you have nice, polished, clean copper, the instant it, uh, the instant you, re it, it, it will immediately grow a, an oxide layer. And so you put two copper pieces together, you've got an oxide layer in between, and that just adds to some boundaries, boundary resistance. Now, if you have copper parts that are coated in gold, you don't have this problem. So this is a good way of doing things, but I wanted to go a little bit deeper here. If Master Yoda were here, he would say, if you have force, use it. And so in this case, if you have force, you don't need area. Now, this becomes very useful in cryogenic engineering and also in uh, sample mounting if you're doing something a little bit unique in the sample area, which most of our customers are doing just that. The best way here is to have conductive surfaces, uh, conductive materials, sorry, smooth surfaces, a soft gold plating, and a bolted connection, which adds the force. A good rule of thumb here is a good bolted connection is worth about 10 watts per Kelvin, so that's the conductance, and that's for each bolt. Now, there, let me put this into perspective a little bit. Let's take these large surfaces here. Let's put a bolt here, 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 and here. Now, if we add that up, that's 40 watts per Kelvin. That's an enormous conductance. Now, imagine the bolts reach through in, in each one of these locations, and they're uh, tightening this plate together. So what happens is you have a very high force area at each one of these locations where I, where I drew the red marks. Now, in all of this surface area here that we have, all of a sudden becomes sort of like a point of diminishing returns, where it, it's really not buying you much because all the conduction, 40 watts per Kelvin, is happening at the very localized high pressure areas. And so that's just an example of why you don't need uh, large surface areas if you have force. In many cases, it's just not feasible to have a lot of surface area because uh, uh, the sample mounting becomes, uh, you become geometrically constrained. constrained. Sample uh, spaces are often small, and there's often a lot going on. Okay, boundary bonding, just a little bit about this. If you look closely at any boundary, it will be just a series of peaks and valleys. So here's, our, here's a, an example. Here's our little gotcha dude there, Murphy, and he's just reminding us that there's, there's a potential problem here. You have peaks and valleys here. Uh, notice that there are only one or two peaks actually touching here. Everything else doesn't, doesn't contribute to the the heat transfer between these two materials. So let's do a little better here. Let's put some grease in there. Now we've got some grease as an interface, and now there's, there is conduction across that interface of grease. But as we, uh, as we know, grease is not a great conductor. We haven't added uh, much conductance to this joint. Okay, what if we smooth down those surfaces? By, by smoothing down those surfaces, we, we still have only one or two points contacting, but we have a smaller interface uh, to travel uh, of grease, for the, uh, and therefore the conduction will increase. The best way to do this is to have smooth greased surfaces that are also pressed. And so now you see the points of contact are much more, and they're also the surface area of each one of those contacts increases from, from the force. And we also have a smaller interface for, uh, for the grease, and so it's just a smaller distance for the heat to trans transfer through the grease.